good morning. morning. Welcome again to One Man's Faith. And it's a fine, sunshiny day, as always in Pahrump, where the sun always shines. Amen. Hardly a, hardly a cloud. A few dust storms, but hardly a cloud. So we're going to get started today. I'm Kevin, and this is my wife, Cherie, as we all know, unless you're the first watching. So we're going to open up in prayer this morning. Mighty God, we just exalt you and praise you for this day, Father God, for this is the day that you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Father God, we just pray that you bless the time we have together, Father God, that you would speak through us and minister to the people watching, Father God, even if they may not watch for another two weeks, but Lord God, that Father God, that you would bless them through this, and that you would just uh, bless all that they have, Father God, and uh, we just give you praise, glory, and honor, and thanksgiving for it, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so today we're going to talk about um, the prophecy uh, and uh, of the destruction of the temple and of the destruction of the temple uh, after uh, Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. Uh, I really wanted to go through this because it's uh, show you, you know, we read about the prophecies, but we never actually go and find out exactly everything that happened. And uh, so it's, it's good to find out that these prophecies were true, yes. they, they took place, and, mm -hmm. and uh, Jesus wasn't just talking, nor were the, any of the other prophets in the Old Testament just talking. So God's Word is true, and what He Amen. says happens. So uh, it's unfortunate that the Israelites, the Jews, did not pay attention to these. So but first off, we're going to go into our opening scripture, which is Revelation 22, verses 6 and 7, and this is out of the New King James Version. Then He said to me, these words are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. And, you know, he says he's coming quickly, and we all, you know, well, you know, it's been over 2,000 years yeah. and everything else, but, you know, remember that one day is a 1,000 years, and a 1,000 years is one day to the Lord, so it's... Um, it, it is going to be quickly, and, it, and the, the, right now time is is going faster and faster, and yes, uh, so is. we are in in the end times for sure. So the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. And um, if anyone is like me, I used to always because everybody always told me uh, A.D. was after death, but it's not. It's it's actually Anno Domini, and that is the year of the Lord. It came about when uh, at the birth of Jesus. Now, the fulfillment of Christ's uh, prophecies uh, concerning the destruction of the magnificent temple in Jerusalem not only reveals the year of uh, Christ's crucifixion, but it also ended one phase of God's plan for salvation of humanity and ushered in the next phase, which is Christ's return to conquer and rule the earth. And there's a lot of things that has to take place uh, between uh, then and the time of, of Christ's return. Yes, yes. And he, he gives people the chance, the opportunity to accept him as their savior. And he also knows that there's other things that has to take place. So this is why it's not just immediate. But in 40 BC, the Roman Senate appointed Herod, later known as Herod the Great, as the ruler of Judea. Herod had previously served as governor of Galilee and was a personal friend of Mark Anthony before Anthony was defeated by Octavian. Uh, later, Herod became a friend of Octavian, who became the first Roman emperor as Caesar Augustus. And they, they changed their names and made it magnificent, I guess, if you <laughs> want to call it that. Uh, but Herod the Great uh, ruled Judea for the next 36 years, uh, during which time he began many new huge building projects, including the building of a new temple in Jerusalem uh, for the worship of God. From the beginning of the temple project in 19 B.C., it took 46 years to complete wow. the main building and another 36 years to finish the entire temple complex. Uh, this was a huge undertaking, which required a tremendous amount of labor and money, and this new temple was said to be a larger and more beautiful temple than the one that Solomon had built. And this temple was actually still under construction when, when, when Jesus, Jesus was there yes. before he was crucified. And uh, they were still working on it. But uh, even during that time, though, it was a magnificent building. Uh, it, it would be hard to imagine what that would look like in their times. When it was more magnificent than Solomon's. Yes. So the historian Josephus, um, and Josephus was a famous historian, um, and he's, he's not uh, a prophet or anything like that. He just has recorded history. 
said that much of the exterior of the temple was covered with gold that reflected the fiery rays of the sun. And years ago, uh, I was in, uh, I believe it was in Toronto, Canada, um, and I went to, uh, went to and toured this, um, I, I never can remember, I used to have a postcard, but it was a, it was a, a big Catholic uh, church, I, I suppose, or uh, synagogue, whatever you want to call it. And everything in that place was just overlaid with gold. It, it was fascinating. I mean, it just it just wow. shined brightly. I mean, everything uh, w was gold. I mean, I can't imagine because uh, what what uh, this temple would have looked like if it was anything like that one. That one was 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 fabulous. But uh, moreover, uh, he said that from a distance, the temple appeared like a mountain covered with snow. And more than likely, it was because uh, parts were not covered with gold, were made of white stone. So from a distance, it would have appeared something like that. From what is said in many writings about Herod's temple, it was indeed a magnificent structure of awesome proportions. However, four years after its completion, it was totally destroyed and wiped from the face of the earth. During Jesus' times, many of the Jews were so awestruck and impressed with the grandeur of the temple that they replaced the worship of God with respect and reverence for the temple complex itself. However, Jesus uh, was not impressed with the temple's physical structure because he knew that the sovereign God was greater than any building that man could construct, no matter how grand and beautiful it was. And we have to remember what Solomon talked about, about the temple, that it was uh, God was too great to, to dwell in, in a yes. building you know, made with hands. And... Uh, this also shows a, a little bit about why the Jews were so um, loyal to the Romans because Herod is the one that built their temple. And uh, so he's the one that made this uh, you know, magnificent yes. place. Actually, they worship the temple, not the God of the temple. So now the prophecies. Uh, Jesus prophesied both the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem. Therefore, it's necessary to discuss both prophecies in order to clearly understand the events that happened 40 years later. Now the temple, in Matthew 24, 1 and 2, the New King James Version. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the building of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. And you can also see that in Luke chapter 21, verses 5 and 6. But in this well-known prophecy about the end of the age recorded by Matthew and Luke, uh, Jesus predicted the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem, uh, which came to pass 40 years after his death and resurrection. Uh, because the temple was, uh, because the disciples, as most of the Jews of their day, especially the Essenes, and I'll tell you about those in a minute, and the Pharisees, they were looking for a Messiah to come who would restore national Israel, set up an earthly kingdom, and destroy the existing temple and build a new one in its place. And you can read this in uh, Ezekiel chapters 40 through 47, which obviously we're not going to read all of those. <laughs> uh, the, the disciples were anxious to know when this would happen. Now, the Essenes uh, were a New Testament religious sect that existed from the 2nd century B.C. to the 1st century A.D. Of the three main religious groups mentioned by Josephus, which we said was a well-known 1st century Jewish historian, they are the only ones that not found directly in Scripture. In Matthew 24, uh, the disciples are asking Jesus when all this stuff was going to take place. So Matthew 24 and verse 3. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now many... Uh, today believe that the answer Jesus gave to his disciples refers to the time that they were living in, although in a general sense some of what he said would apply to their age, uh, the age in which they lived. Uh, Jesus did not answer the first part of their question, uh, when will this happen? Uh, he answered it in uh, Luke, you find the answer in Luke 21, 12 through 24, which we will read uh, shortly. Uh, instead, he began to answer their other two questions, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? with a general overview of the things that would happen at the end of this age just prior to his return. So Matthew 24, verses 4 through 8 tells us, And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and I will deceive many. 
and you will hear of wars and rumor of wars. See that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, and pestilence, and earthquakes in various places. And all these are the beginning of sorrows. And if, if anybody would be listening to what Jesus was saying, they should have taken heed to what he said. And, and you know, because the, these things weren't um, in secret. He wasn't doing anything in secret. After Jesus' resurrection from the dead, the disciples asked a similar question to the one uh, that they had asked him after their temple visit, during which he told them about world events at the end of this age. And we're going to read that in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. And then we're going to read Luke uh, chapter 21, verses 12 through 24. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake, but it will turn out for you as an occasion for a testimony. Therefore, sell it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. But you will be betrayed even by parents, brothers, relatives, and friends. Okay, we're going to have to stop right there. We're going to get ready to take our first break, and we will be right back. Stay with us, and there'll be more. Okay, welcome and back. welcome back to One Man's Faith. We're going to kind of pick this up in the middle where she was reading. Uh, we were reading Luke chapter 21, verses 12 through 24. So go ahead. Therefore, sell it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. But not a hair of your head shall be lost. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart, and let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant, and to those who are nursing babies in those days. For there will be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people." And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captives into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Sorry, I didn't mean to disrupt you. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I want to touch on verse 18. It says, but not a hair of your head shall be lost. And apparently this is a, is a fairly, uh, I shouldn't say popular, but uh, saying that was in the Old Testament, the New Testament. Um, what Dakes and other commentators say of this is that not one genuine Christian shall fall in the destruction of Jerusalem. And now there are obviously other uh, commentators. Um, they go into a lot of other detail, bringing in a lot of other scripture. Um, and, but uh, apparently uh, during the downfall of Jerusalem, they said that there wasn't one actual Christian that lost their life. Oh. Uh, now, you know... Here, here again, this is just, we weren't there. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. So, so looking back on the task that Jesus gave to the disciples after his resurrection and the ensuing history of the early church, not allowing these men to know the date of the destruction of the temple, his coming to power and the end of the age of human rule on earth, helped keep them focused on their task and from being discouraged because these events were not to happen as soon as they expected. And, and you have to think that that would, that would be true because if somebody told you, okay, well, uh, you know, next Tuesday at 3 o'clock, you're going to die, what would you do? I mean, your whole, your whole outlook of everything would change as to, and, and you, you probably wouldn't do the things that you really need to do or should do. 
And the same thing with the disciples. Yeah. If they had known all this stuff, they they may not have, uh, you know, it's just like the parables that Jesus said. If the if the uh, the the servant didn't know when his master was coming back, and you know, we just have to be ready. And uh, or the you know the, the parable of the, of the said if the guy knew when the guy was going to break into his house and steal his stuff, he would have secured everything. Yeah. So we have to go on with our daily lives and and continue to. Uh, make disciples, uh, not just make salvations, but make disciples of, of people and bring people into the kingdom of God and do our job for the kingdom of God. So, um, all right, so Matthew twenty-eight, nineteen, and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Amen. So we are to make disciples, not just converts, as I said. A convert can be like the, the seed sown on stony ground. Uh, we'll read that here, Mark four sixteen and 17. And these are they likewise, which are sown on stony ground, who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. So, you know, to go out and just, and, and, and I've done this in the past, and I've talked to people and just led them in the sinner's prayer and said, hey, oh, great, great, you're a Christian, see ya. And uh, it didn't last long. They, they really weren't, you know, they, they just repeated what you said. They didn't mean yeah. it in their heart. You didn't, you didn't disciple them you didn't bring them into that saving knowledge of jesus christ you just had them repeat the words and so this is why we need to make yes. disciples because you need to go and disciple that person teach them bring them along help them to grow so in jerusalem now there were two occasions on which jesus foretold the destruction of jerusalem that would occur in 70 a.d the first was when he entered the city and the people laid their clothes on the ground before him which was the custom to honor someone of great importance such as a king. And we'll read this out of Luke chapter 19, verse 36 through 46. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had been saying. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and he wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in every side, and level you and your children with you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Then he went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in it, saying to them, It is written, My house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves." Now, this was quite a, quite a prophecy, and, uh, but because people did not want to believe that he was the Messiah, obviously they didn't, they didn't believe him, and, and they just kind of you know, scoffed at him and everything. Though it's interesting that they went to all this trouble to welcome him into Jerusalem as king, though they kind of recanted after that. Uh, you know, they didn't, they didn't, you That's know. That's how fickle people's minds are. Yeah, well, you know, they, 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 they didn't. They didn't want to go against the, the Pharisees and, and all the, the leaders. So it's important to understand that Jesus was no ordinary man. He was the creator God who voluntarily gave up his immortal existence to become human and die for the sins of humanity. And he did willingly go up on the cross for you and I. Uh, so uh, he, he did that on his own. Uh, Jesus understood that although the plan for the salvation of humanity required certain events to take place, if people would repent of their evil ways, these events could be modified and worked out in other ways that would allow for less pain and suffering and in order to fulfill God's plan for humanity. 
uh, although Jesus did understand uh, that his heavenly Father was merciful, he also understood the heart of the vast majority of the Jews and their leadership yeah. and that they would not repent of their evil ways. Uh, this is one of the reasons he wept over uh, Jerusalem as he foretold its destruction. Now we have uh, today in, in not only the society but in, in the church itself, uh, they're, act, they're afraid to stand up for Jesus. They're afraid of, of government, peer pressure, or even losing jobs. We have it's a, it's a sad situation where uh, people lose their jobs yes. uh, because of, you know, standing up for Jesus and professing yeah. to be a Christian. Uh, we see that, you know, and we expect to see that in other lands, you know, especially in the Islamic states, but we wouldn't expect that here in this country. But unfortunately, it's, it's growing yes. more and more. And they're trying so hard to get rid of Christianity because it brings to light their sin. Uh, so many uh, Jews were afraid of being thrown out of the synagogue that they would not follow Jesus. Uh, and, and we read that here a few weeks ago, or uh, maybe, I think we did, maybe more yeah. we about uh, the, the blind man and his parents would not testify you know, in, in him and for Jesus because they didn't want to get thrown out of the synagogue. So Revelation 3.16 tells us, So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Yes, he will spew thee out of your mouth. And so we'd have to, we don't want to, we don't want to be lukewarm. No. Uh, we don't want to have a form of godliness and deny the power thereof. Uh, and, and we see that a lot. You know, people, oh yeah, I, I believe in everything, but they don't believe in the power of God. They don't understand what, who he is. Uh, so the second time that Jesus predicted the destruction of Jerusalem was as he was being led to the place of his execution. The streets along the way were packed with his enemies as well as with those who enthusiastically followed his teaching and were hopeful that he was indeed the prophesied Messiah. And we're going to read Luke chapter 23, verses 27 through 30. And there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in which they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear, and the paps which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. So when Jesus said to those who were showing their concern for him, and the injustices that was about to befall him foretold the destruction of Jerusalem and the horrible starvation, sickness, and death that would come upon them before and after the Romans destroyed the city and its temple. It is also possible that what he said to these women may also have some application during the end of this age just before his return. And we're going to read uh, out of Hosea uh, chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. Israel is a luxuriant vine. He produces fruit for himself. The more his fruit, the more altars he made, the richer his land, the better he made the sacred pillars. Their heart is faithful, faithless. Now they must bear their guilt. The Lord will break down their altars and destroy their sacred pillars. Surely now they will say, we have no king, for we do not revere the Lord. As for the king, what can he do to us? They speak mere words. With worthless oaths, they make covenants. And judgment sprouts like poisonous weeds in the furrows of the field. The inhabitants of Samaria will fear for the calf of beth Even, Indeed, its peoples will mourn for it, and its idolatrous priests will cry out over it, over its glory, since it has departed from it. The thing itself will be carried to Assyria as tribute to King Jerob. Ephraim will be seized with shame, and Israel will be ashamed of its own counsel. Samaria will be cut off with her king like a stick on the surface of the water. And also the high places of Avon, the sin of Israel, will be destroyed. Okay. So we're going to just have a little bit more left on this. We'll pick that up uh, after this break. We'll be right back. And we're Welcome back again back. for session number yes. three. And again, we're going to pick up in the middle <laughs> of the, this uh, Hosea uh, chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. The inhabitants of Samaria will fear for the calf of Beth-Avon. 
Indeed, its peoples will mourn for it, and its idolatrous priests will cry out over it, over its glory, since it has departed from it. The thing itself will be carried to Assyria as tribute to King Jerob. Ephraim will be seized with shame, and Israel will be ashamed of its own counsel. Samaria will be cut off with her king like a stick on the surface of the water. Also, the high places of Avon and the sin of Israel will be destroyed. Thorn and thistle will grow on their altars. Then they will say to the mountains, Cover us, and the hills, fall on us. From the days of Gibeah, Gibeah what is it? Gibeah. Gibeah, you have sinned, O Israel. There they stand. Will not the battle against the sons of iniquity overtake them in Gibeah? Gibeah. There you go. <laughs> when it is my desire, I will chastise them, and the peoples will be gathered against them when they are bound for their double guilt. So the uh, it talks about the oaths that they make and the covenants that were worthless because they didn't they didn't keep their covenants, they didn't keep their oaths, um, and again. Uh, they're just so scared and afraid of all the sins. They just want the mountains to cover them, the hills to fall on them. Uh, so it's um, and it's just a, it's just a sad time. Yes. It really, it is. Now let's, let's go to Passover in 30 A.D., uh, which is the one when uh, Jesus was crucified. And the Passover season of 30 A.D. 30 A.D. began much as it had in previous years. Thousands of pilgrims from all over the world crowded into Jerusalem because they were concerned with preparing for the Passover. They did not realize that this particular Passover would be the most important event in all of human history. It was on this Passover that the Lamb of God would be sacrificed for the sins of humanity. Jesus died about 3 p.m. on Friday afternoon of 30 A.D. on the first of two authorized Passover ceremonies. His death set into motion a series of events and warnings to the Jews which were meant to show that indeed the Jews had murdered the Messiah and that his prophecy concerning the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem would come to pass. And so uh, now we want to get into it's, it's the earthquake. And it says that there were three simultaneous events that happened during the earthquake at Jesus' death that are of major importance to the fulfillment of the prophecies concerning the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem. The first one was, the veil of separation uh, was torn from top to bottom. And that's the throne of grace in Hebrews 4.16. It says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Uh, the tombs were opened, and the dead were raised to life. Jesus was acknowledged as the Son of God. Uh, a centurion acknowledged Him. And that's, that's kind of an important issue. We'll get to that in a minute. So now the curtain of separation, the veil of the temple. History seems to indicate that there were two curtains in Herod's temple, one at the huge uh, gated entry into the temple and the other separating the Holy of Holies and the main sanctuary. These curtains were said to be 60 feet long, 30 feet wide, and as thick as the palm of a man's hand. Now, those are pretty big curtains. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we are told that these curtains were so heavy that 300 priests were needed to manipulate each one. Uh, the curtain being torn from top to bottom was a foreboding omen indicating that God's hand had torn it in two and that His presence was leaving that holy place. Wow. Uh, you have to think of how these people wow. thought and what this temple was made for. It was made, the Holy of Holies was made for the presence of God to be there. And, and that's where the, only the priests were allowed to go there. And so this meant a, a great deal to them. Now the, the curtain separated the holy place from everyone but the high priest. The holy place was where the presence of God dwelled on the mercy seat. The curtain was a constant reminder to the Israelites that their access to God depended on another physical human being, namely the priest, and that this access was only granted through the physical works of the sacrificial system. In other words, they had to sacrifice animals and the, the priest would then go in and he would make atonement for their sin. Now, you've got to realize that that only lasted for a year. Then they had to come back and do it the next year. Yeah. You know, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't like, like it is now after the crucifixion of Jesus. So Matthew 15, 37 and 38. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the spirit. And the veil of the temple was torn in half 
from top to the bottom. And Matthew 27, 50 and 52. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And I, I wanted to read both of those just simply because, of, of, you know, it's mentioned. So it, this is what happened. And also that the uh, tombs were open and um, many bodies of the, of the saints that had fallen asleep were raised from the dead. Now consider the erroneous uh, significance of this monumental historical event. Enormous, I'm sorry. Enor consider the enormous significance of this monumental historical event. Uh, picture Jesus' loud and painful cry, It is finished. And in some of the places that they did these things, the, the voices could be heard yeah. uh, everywhere. Uh, if you look and you see where Jesus was, was, was talking to many people, and of course he didn't have a microphone, didn't have, you know, <laughs> didn't have the big screen and all that. Uh, so his voice was able to be heard. So it was, it was a place where the, his voice could carry. So... Um, <clears throat> Uh, so anyway, and Jesus cried, it is finished, and the curtain tore, the relationship between God and humanity was altered forever. The tearing of the curtain of separation from top to bottom forever opens the way for all humanity to, to eventually fellowship directly with God the Father. Uh, there, is, there is the moment in time that Jesus spoke of, spoke of to the woman of Samaria, the woman at the well, when he foretold that the existing worship system would be abolished and that those who wanted to worship God would no longer need to travel to a specific location to worship. And this is what he was talking about. So we'll read that in John chapter 4, 19 through 23. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is for, from the Jews, but an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. So no longer would a physical man be required to offer animal sacrifices for sins and who truly worship and sins. Any who truly worship the Father can now stand before him and present their own cause to him, knowing that he will hear and consider their prayer because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So the Apostle Paul also explains this improved relationship between God and non-Israelites to the elect of the city of Ephesus. And then we read that in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 16. Wherefore, remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who was made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, for to make in himself a twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both to God and in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. So verse 14, um, it talks about... Um, who has made both one, and as Jews and Gentiles are now one in Christ, yes. uh, so that um, uh, they're not separate. We are all together in Christ Jesus. We are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And uh, you need to remember this sometimes when you talk to your brothers and sisters in, in Christ in church that talk yes. nicely <laughs> because they are your brothers and sisters. So, with the tearing of the curtain, all who worship God, whether Jew or Gentile, have access to the throne of mercy by the one and final sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. And uh, there's a variety of scriptures that you can look at, but we're going to take uh, two of these. Hebrews chapter 6, uh, verses 18 and 20. 
so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek. And you can read Melchizedek back in the time of Abraham. He was yes. without uh, end or beginning. Now Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 22. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And this is just such a fantastic thing that we have this with God, that we can, we can come before him and, and bring our prayers, our petitions yes. before him. And we're not having to go through a priest or we're not having to go somewhere and, and ask somebody to forgive us of our sins because God forgives us. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins yes. and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So uh, I want to read um, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now therefore you are fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. So, amen, we are uh, amen. fellow citizens uh, and we are of the household of God. Uh, it, it's just fantastic sometimes. I, I, I just, I, I love learning more about the Bible. I love reading the Bible. Uh, you just get closer to God and find out really who He is. So we're going to get ready and take our final break here and then we will be right back with number four. Stay with us. And welcome back to session number four, the final one for this uh, day. So and we're going to pick back up where we left off. We had just finished re reading Ephesians 2, 18 and 19, and that we have one access by one spirit to the Father. Amen. And that is just uh, just magnificent. It's just wonderful that we have that. Yes. That we can go into the most holiest by the blood of Jesus. Now the next one here is the dead raised. The earthquake and resurrection of the righteous dead at the death of Jesus pertains to a number of prophetic events for that time and the future. This event was evidence that God had fulfilled His promise contained in many prophecies about the redemption of humanity. A way uh, was now open for all who would truly worship God yes. to have victory over sin and death. Uh, this event also pointed toward the future when a great earthquake will shake the entire earth before the return of Christ to gather the righteous dead of all ages to meet Him in the air. Amen. And we will meet Him in the Amen. air. Amen. And uh, I'm looking forward to that time. And, and you know, you can be pre-trib, pre -trib, post-trib, during-trib, no-trib, whatever you want to be. But I, I want to be pre-trib because I don't want to be here when <laughs> all this stuff takes place. So there's gonna, it's just not going to be a good time. So 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, verses 16 and 17 uh, tells us, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of, the, of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. Amen. We will be there for always, so I want to make sure that I'm sure in that go. group. Yes, <laughs> I don't want to... Don't want to miss that boat. So this resur resurrection of the dead uh, shows the following. Uh, Christ's blood is life-giving, pictured in the blood of Pentecost, in the, uh, excuse me, pictured in the blood of the Passover lamb, and has now wiped away the penalty of sin. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. For all those who uh, only had their sins covered by the sacrificial lamb, animals... And, and you have to remember that because that's why they had to go back yearly to the temple. Their sins were just covered for that time. Then they had to go back and do it all over again. Um, there will be a time when all those who have or will have lived a righteous life will be given eternal and immortal life at the return of Jesus Christ. 
The great enemy death has lost its power over humanity through the sacrificial blood of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, the Son of God, Matthew 27, verse 54. Now when the centurion and they that were with him, watching Jesus, saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. So the Jews had rejected Christ as the Messiah and murdered him as their, uh, their fathers had murdered many others whom God had sent to them to teach his laws and ways of life. They killed so many prophets because they just didn't like what they, you know, what they say. Mm -hmm. And this is where we get the thing, you know, don't, don't kill the messenger. <laughs> but, um, you know, that's what they did. Um, to their shame, it was a Roman centurion, not an Israelite, who recognized and acknowledged Jesus as the Son of God. And um, so there's other scriptures that you can look at there. Um, because of their rejection on the Messiah and His message, the Jews would now pay a heavy price. The magnificent structure which symbolized God's presence and on which the Jews lavished much praise and showed great reverence would be destroyed along with their beloved city. Now we get into some interesting things and, and uh, realize that there was a lot of things that took place back then that doesn't take place now and, and the things that they believed, but the presence of God and, and uh, you know, we had, they had a lot of appearance of angels and so forth as well as, as demons. But the temple gates. Now the Jews, Jewish Talmud says that 40 years before the temple was destroyed, the gates of the temple opened by themselves until Rabbi Yohanan uh, rebuked them, saying, Heckle, heckle, why do you alarm us? We know that you are destined to be destroyed. And he was prophesying right there, you know. So yeah. uh, the priests understood that for uh, Ezekiel's prophecy to be fulfilled, the existing temple would have to be destroyed and a new one built. However, because they did not understand the prophecies concerning the Messiah of their time, they did not understand the supernatural opening of the gates to mean that the old system of atonement was being replaced with a new one. Now, the Sanhedrin, and this is interesting um, too to, to learn this. Yeah. Uh, the Sanhedrin officiated from the chamber of Hone Stone, which was about 120 feet southeast of the temple and its enormous stones, stone lintel, which was at least 30 feet long, weighed some 30 tons and had cracked during the earthquake at the Messiah's death. History tells us that the Sanhedrin moved from their opulent surroundings in the chamber of Hone Stones to lesser accommodations shortly after the earthquake. Because there is no record of the Sanhedrin being forced by the Romans to move from the temple, which would have caused a major political crisis anyway, uh, one can assume that the Sanhedrin moved because the earthquake has so damaged the building that it was unsafe for them to continue to meet there. It is interesting that prior to the Messiah's crucifixion in 30 AD, the Romans had taken away the Sanhedrin's authority to execute criminals. The last judgment the Sanhedrin made from the temple was to sentence the Messiah and creator of humanity to death. From 30 AD to the time of this writing, no Sanhedrin has officiated from a temple in Jerusalem. With the departure of the Sanhedrin from the chamber of Hone Stones, the law no longer went forth from the temple. So, um, wow. That's, uh, you know, that's just really interesting. Uh, they could no longer be there. Now, 40 years of warnings. Um, many wonder why God waited 40 years after Jesus' death and resurrection to fulfill this prophecy about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. First, the number of 40 in the Bible is symbolic of trial, testing, and punishment. Second, waiting 40 years shows God, God's patience yes. in allowing the Jews time to repent and turn back to Him with proper behavior and worship so that... He could bless them instead of punishing them. Israel wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, could they have repented? Could they have their punishment have been diminished somewhat? We don't know. But God could have gave them time. They were there for 40 years. Uh, he was merciful in the sense that their clothes never wore out and all that kind of stuff, but uh, they could have possibly repented. Although the temple and city were not destroyed until 70 A.D., the supernatural events that occurred uh, on the day of Messiah was murdered were only a few of the many warnings given to the Jewish people prior to the destruction of their beloved temple and city on the day of, <clears throat> on the day of atonement in 30 AD. So there was a, a series of two consecutive warnings that were repeated on this day uh, for another 39 years. Uh, but I'm going to go uh, beyond this a minute and 
we're going to read because I want you, I want to see this. Um, the actual destruction of the temple in, in uh, Jerusalem destroyed. Uh, see if I can find it here anyway. Um, so, <clears throat> anyway, the Jewish people that... Um, um, here, we, we'll, I'll just read you this here. It says, During the Feast of Unleavened Bread in 66 A.D., at about three in the morning, a light was bright, day, as bright as daylight appeared around the altar for half an hour. Although some thought it was a, a good sign, the scribes understood it to be a precursor of the supernatural events that followed during the feast. A heifer lay, being led for sacrifice was said to have given birth to a lamb in the midst of the temple. Around midnight during the feast, the huge eastern gate of the inner court of the temple, which was made of brass and normally took 20 men to shut, opened on its own. And uh, I want to read, because that, that opening of the temple coincides with, actually coincides a little bit with Peter uh, in Acts chapter 12. I want to read Acts chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. Okay, there you go. I'll read. And he went out and followed him, and was not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. And when, when they were past the first and the second ward, they came into the iron gates that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of their own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And this was about that same time as they were talking here. So anyway, we can uh, come back to that another time. But it is, I, just, I just wanted to show you uh, some about that. But um, we do want you to understand... Um, that the prophecies in the Bible, everything that the Bible says is true. And I think by, I wanted to go through this, and we may finish it another time, but um, what the Bible says is true. It came about. So what the Bible tells us in Revelations and as well as in yes. other, other areas, because the, the, everything is foretold in the Bible, mm -hmm. throughout the Bible, uh, is true. You need to be ready. Um, you know, we have various par parables. You have the parables of the ten virgins, which... Five were ready, and the other five, five were not, not. ready. Uh, you have a lot of things warning you, and to be ready, and don't go and say, "Okay, well, my master is waiting. I'm just going to have a party here." You know, uh, well, he's going to come in a time that you're not ready, and then it's going to be too late. So, you need to really um, be ready and, and accept Christ as your Savior, because He is coming back. It's not a it's not a game. It's not a myth. It's not a fairy tale. Uh, the Bible is for today. It's not just an old book. It is for today. It's been around all this time, and it will continue yes. to be around. Uh, so, um, but don't hesitate. Uh, so, we, we've told you uh, where sin came into the world through one man, and that was Adam, and death through him, and life everlasting came through, and, and forgiveness of sin through one man, Jesus Christ. Um, and uh, again, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And if we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive Amen. us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes. I will tell you straight up, I went through the salvation procedure, if you want, so many times before I really meant it in my heart. And then when I finally meant it, when I finally really gave in to Christ and gave myself mm -hmm. to Christ, it was just phenomenal. I just really wish I had done it so much earlier. Uh, but I am heaven-bound, and I hope that Amen. you're heaven-bound. And we're both heaven-bound, actually. And uh, I, I know that she'll get there. <laughs> anyway, uh, but uh, we just love the Lord, and we just want to do what He wants us to do. So we're glad that you've been with us. We hope you stay with us. And uh, we'll be back next week. Have a wonderful week in the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.